So I've titled this series, The Importance of Grace. Uh, Grace is more than a, a doctrine as you begin to probe the depths of all that the Scripture has to offer. We see in the New Testament that really grace is the gospel. In fact, one time uh, Paul calls the gospel the gospel of grace. And so uh, grace is not a, a trendy movement. It's not a special focus. Grace is not my idea or your idea or something made popular this century. Uh, grace is a very, very old idea. And in fact, it is the concept of grace that Paul so adamantly defends in the book of Galatians. Have you ever studied the book of Galatians? It is full of fire. I mean, there is fiery frustration and anger and sarcasm and all kinds of things coming from the pen of the Apostle Paul as he writes them. And it's pretty fun to sort of be a fly on the wall watching this uh, communication happen. Uh, a lot of times people think the Bible is very peaceful and docile and easygoing in its principles, but the book of Galatians will blow that to smithereens because Paul has a chip on his shoulder. Uh, he's defending his gospel. He feels that other people have perverted the gospel that he brought to the Galatians, and he wants to fix the situation. Now, some people wrongly assume that this grace message in the book of Galatians is all about salvation. Let me say at the outset of this series that it's not about salvation alone. Very clearly, Paul in the third chapter of this epistle says, Having begun by the Spirit, are we now? And so he's asking the Galatians a question not about salvation, but about after beginning by the Spirit, how do we now live? What is the approach? And implied there is the importance of God's grace. God's grace is not just for salvation, but it is for daily living. We live by grace, we live under grace, we live because of grace, and grace, God's grace, is what has equipped us to live a godly life. So as we journey through this series, there's going to be ups and downs and highs and lows, and, and uh, it's just going to be a real adventure as we probe the depths of all that Paul would have to tell us. You know, he called the Galatians foolish. He said, you foolish Galatians. Here we are 2,000 years later, and from what I can tell out there in the United States and around the world, in the area of Christianity at least, uh, Paul might say the very same thing to us these days. You foolish Americans, who has tricked you? And uh, it's not about our nation, it's just about religion. The pull of religion. The temptation to make things about rules and regulations. And the flesh, you know, in our humanity, the flesh is very religious. So this tendency is not just Galatian. The tendency is not just American. Uh, the tendency is very, very human. So with that said, let's begin by jumping right into the first chapter of Galatians. I want to remind you that this audience is Galatian. Now that should be obvious to you, but what I mean by that is because they are in this region, Galatia, because they are in this city, in this area, they are Gentiles receiving this letter. That is, they're not Jewish people. And you'll notice that as we unfold what Paul is going to tell them over the next several weeks, Paul is having to undo a lot of Moses-type teaching. He's having to undo a lot of the, the law-based teaching. And uh, again, the fact that they are... Galatians, meaning Gentiles, meaning non-Jews, Paul shouldn't even have to do this. And that's why he's angry. <laughs> that's why he's frustrated. Because he shouldn't even have to do this. He came in, not with Moses under his arm, teaching them the law, but he came in proclaiming Jesus Christ crucified and Jesus Christ alone as sufficient for salvation and for growth, for daily living for all aspects of spiritual life, and someone 
more than one person, some group of men came in behind him and deceived many and began to compromise the gospel, began to mix Moses with Jesus. And as you know that I I like to say, flirting with Moses is cheating on Jesus. And Paul holds this attitude as he addresses them. Now, let's begin in the first verse here of Galatians chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men, nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who were with me. Now, why would Paul start his letter this way? It's authority that he is expressing here. He's saying, I did not get this message from men. It wasn't an invention. It wasn't my own concoction. I didn't dream it up, nor did anyone else who's with me. This message, this gospel, came not through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Now, why would he need to stress this? Because the gospel, quite frankly, is counterintuitive. Have you not encountered that? That as you share the message of God's grace... You don't always get a lot of, uh uh-huh, 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 yeah, 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 that's cool with me, I'm good with that. You get a whole lot of, but, 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 wait, but what about, and there's much hesitation, there's wrestling, there's insecurity with the message, there's doubt, there's, this can't be right, this is too good to be true. All of this sort of doubt creeps up. Because the gospel of grace is very counterintuitive. And so Paul is reassuring them. He's ensuring them up front that, uh, you know, this isn't made up stuff. That this is coming from God himself. And so for that reason, this gospel can be known. This gospel can be trusted. And this gospel will be a source of life. The same life that resurrected Jesus from the dead. He says to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. So much contained again in these opening verses. Number one, the churches are in Galatia. They are Gentile churches, not Jewish churches. Number two, the first thing off of his lips toward them is grace. Grace to you. Grace in your direction. Grace for you. God is, is, is wanting them to know that he is all about grace toward them. Now, get to know these Galatians. I mean, first of all, They're not law-abiding citizens. They have been historically all over the place, rebels, barbarians, uh, worshiping false gods in the past, uh, temples to goddesses, a lot of pagan deities, idol worship, you name it. Uh, It was, as I've said before about other places, these Gentile hubs. I mean, it was like Las Vegas, and uh, it was like Mardi Gras, And it was like spring break, all stirred together in a pot with steroids on top of it. I mean, it was crazy stuff. These were the ways that Greeks, Gentiles lived. And so, in this region, Paul, having known where they've come from, that they've done these heinous things in the past, that they're still growing and learning and stumbling in many ways, that their performance is all over the place... What comes off of his lips, what he writes with his pen, is that God has grace toward them. And I I wish that we could soak that in, in and of itself, if we could walk out of here today just knowing that God is grace to me, God is grace to me all the time, God is grace to me, and he wants me to know it. He says, grace and peace, we have peace with God. Every single person who is in Christ has peace with God. You say, well, you know, right now I'm stuck in some some stuff. I feel like I've shipwrecked my faith. You say, 
Maybe I'm caught in a sin. I'm caught in an addiction. I can't stop what I'm doing. I'm in a lifestyle right now. I've made some choice and I find myself halfway down the road and it's so hard I can't turn around and come back. I don't feel like I have any victory over it. I don't feel like I have the power to choose. And I feel like I feel like God is so distant and so far and that I'm so dirty. What I would say is that in my experience, there is only one train of thought that will be your rescue. And it's not that if I quit this, God will like me again. That's not it. It's not that if I pull a 180 and turn away from this, then God will accept me and love me and forgive me. That's not it. The the train of thought that has rescued me in my lifetime so far, the, the big train of thought that has rescued me in those moments is this. I can go against every ounce of my feelings right now I can go against every ounce of these thoughts that have been trained in this direction. I can choose against those thoughts and I can choose against those feelings and I can actually choose in agreement with this belief that I am not made for this, that God, it's not just that He forgives me and loves me and that I'm at peace with Him and that He accepts me, but He indwells me and He's with me now. He's in me right now and this is not of Him and this is not of me. It's not of Him and it's not of me. It's not of us and and it needs not have any place in my life. And so when I turn and escape the clutches of temptation, it, it's teamwork. It's not just God coming down on me, telling me, Thou shalt not. It's greater than that. It's better than that. The new covenant is more beautiful than that. It's that God has already changed my heart, changed my desires, indwelled me, and it's teamwork, and it's a we, it's a union. I'm united with Christ by His grace, not just forgiven and and loved and accepted, but I am changed at the core, and I'm united with Him, and we are going to find a way out together. Do you see that? We're on the same team with the God of the universe, and we have peace with Him. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins. Number one, I talked about this last week in in part of the, the Truth About series. We see two reasons that Jesus died. Number one, He gave Himself for our sins. That is, He was a sacrifice a payment in full, a propitiation, a satisfying sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, not like bulls and goats, but the once-for-all sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so here He is. He gave Himself for our sins, and secondly, He gave Himself to rescue us from this present evil age. There is rescue from the world And there is forgiveness for our sins. These are both included in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. According to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. In other words, bragging about this stuff, investing in this, celebrating this gospel, this is what gives glory to the Father because the Father wants to showcase the Son. We make a big deal about Jesus around here. And that's because the Holy Spirit in us is pointing to Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And we know that when we point to Jesus, that it glorifies the Father. And so the entire Trinity is involved in this. And the point is to showcase the finished work of Jesus Christ. All right, as he continues, Paul writes and he says, I'm amazed. This is where things turn. He's had his... Nice, polite greeting. He's defended his apostleship. He said he got his message from God. He, the sweet talk is over, and here it comes. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who, who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. What flavor of distortion are we talking about? 
Well, it's going to become obvious as we progress through this epistle that people have distorted it by saying, that's great that you're saved, but... That's great that that you're saved by the grace of God, but... And they're sticking the big but right there in the middle of the gospel. And so they're saying, Jesus plus nothing but... They're saying Jesus is everything but. They're saying the grace of God accomplishes all but. And maybe you've run into these big buts, right? You've run into them as you've communicated with friends and relatives and those around you. And you've been in the midst of your testimony. I am so thankful. Let me tell you what I've been learning. I have learned that I'm a totally forgiven person once for all, because Jesus died once and it worked and he doesn't need to die again and all my sins were taken away. And thank you, Lord, and I'm so grateful for this, what I've been learning. And you turn and you look into the eyes of the person you're talking to and their first word is, but you still have to, but you still have to go to church, but you still have to apologize for every sin to get forgiven, but you still have to confess them all to keep forgiven, but you still, but you still, but, but, but. Do you see it? They put the big but right down in the middle of your testimony. (laughs) And then the whole thing goes downhill because we have added to the finished work of Jesus at that point. And so... Paul is wanting the finished work of Jesus to to just be front and center, to be center stage, to be spotlighted without anything to ruin it. And so he is saying, I'm amazed that you guys have been duped by this. I'm amazed that you guys have been tricked by this. I'm amazed that you guys are deserting the truth and now going with plan B. I'm amazed that you guys are buying this idea, this garbage, this idea that we need to add to what Jesus Christ already did. And so he says these people are distorting the gospel. Then he says, look, even if we, any one of us apostles, even if we or an angel from heaven, like if an angelic spiritual being swooped down into this auditorium with wings on his back and started preaching to you a gospel that is contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we've said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Wow. Now, this is some pretty strong language. The point is this. The takeaway from this passage is this. It doesn't matter how eloquent someone is. It doesn't matter how much power they seem to wield. It doesn't matter if they appear to be an angel. Wow, how impressive it would be to see an angelic being come down here on this stage and present a totally different message. If that were to happen, would you be duped? Would you be tricked? Would you be persuaded? This is a sincere question to ask yourself. Do you allow the appearance of the person to persuade you? Do you allow the power and the persistence and the persuasive words of a person to convince you? Or do you allow the truth of the gospel to stand in your life? When do you waver? Do you waver because someone sounds with their slick talk and their inventive language and their extra biblical terminology and their degrees and their appearance of scholarship And all of this, is this what we allow to persuade us to move away from the grace of God and to no longer invest exclusively in the finished work of Jesus Christ and to instead opt for a counterfeit, opt for something that is no gospel at all. Paul says, watch out for that. Paul struggled with it himself. Do you know that? That Paul 
uh, struggled with uh, the idea of was he a good enough speaker and did people uh, look at him as a super apostle as uh, you know, some of these Christians were looking at other people who would come in after him and he had to constantly defend his apostleship saying this, saying this, that I saw Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus I saw him, I laid eyes on him, I experienced him, I am an apostle, I have authority. Don't be duped by those who would come in after me with a different message. I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received. Well, how do you know what you got? I mean, at the beginning, what was the first part of the gospel? Remember, this is the gospel, Lord Jesus Christ I cannot save myself. I am unable. I am inept. It is impossible for me to save me. And so I call upon you by your grace, by faith, I call upon you and your grace to save me and do for me what I cannot do for myself. Now, you wake up Monday morning and you're a saved person. You're a new creation in Christ. Now, how do you live? Lord Jesus Christ, I cannot live the Christian life. Apart from you, I can do nothing. And so, yes, I am saved, but I still need your grace to the fullest. Every day, every moment, all day long, by grace, you have equipped me. I am going to let you do for me what I cannot do for you. And so, the life of grace continues beyond the moment of salvation. And if anyone tells you the life is lived by another means be it law, be it human effort, be it rules and regulations, he says, let them be accursed. Don't waver, don't worry, don't be bothered, don't be moved by another message. Remain stable. Jesus Christ is enough. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. In other words, man, people wouldn't have any problem with me. If I were pleasing men, I'd know how to do it. Let me tell you what I'd do. I mean, if I were just seeking the, the, the pleasing of men, well, then I would balance this thing out. I'd say, well, there's grace, and then there's law, and there's Jesus, but then there's Moses. And what we really need is a nice mix of the two. In fact, Jesus will help you keep Moses. And so we don't want to move away from Moses. Let's put Moses and Jesus together in a nice concoction, and this is our gospel. Now, isn't everyone happy? Jews, are you happy? I brought in Moses. Gentiles, are you happy? I brought in Jesus. And so if Paul were pleasing men, he would concoct such a gospel, a mixture of law and grace. Of course, we know there's no place for that mixture. Paul says, apart from law, sin is dead. Romans tells us you died to the law so that you might live for God. You only live for God by dying to the law. Christians should have no spiritual relationship with the law. The law is for the unbeliever to show them their sin. But Christians die to the law so that we can live for God. And so Paul taught a message that did not please men, especially religious men. And this is why the Galatians were so easily tricked because others would come in and they would teach what seems to please the flesh in human effort. For I would have you know, brethren, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, affirming the source of his message, affirming his apostleship, affirming his authority, saying, I didn't make this stuff up, that's why this stuff is incredible It's not intuitive. It's not a human invention. It is literally from heaven. This grace and this grace message and this gospel of grace is heavenly. It is heaven sent. For you've heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond measure. Many of my contemporaries among my countrymen being more extremely zealous 
for my ancestral traditions. You want to talk about an intense dude. I mean, Saul of Tarsus was the most intense dude you could ever meet. You talk about dedication and commitment. He was it. You look up dedication and commitment in the Jewish encyclopedia, and you'd see Saul of Tarsus's picture there. I mean, he was for real. He was sold out. He was on fire, right? He was a big deal. If you were growing up as a Pharisee and you were studying the law, you might look to Saul of Tarsus as your idol. I mean, you weren't supposed to have any idols, but I mean, you would look to him and you might emulate him because he was the epitome of dedication and commitment and scholarship and sold-outness to God. You've heard of me, my former manner of life. I even went so far as to kill Christians. I was trying to snuff out that movement, that false movement of Christians, he thought. And he was advancing in Judaism. He was an expert, a Pharisee of Pharisees. You know his resume. He had all the right paperwork, totally zealous, completely sold out. And then he says, but... Now, this is a good but. I told you about some bad buts earlier, but this is a good but because here it is. It's three words long, but when God. In other words, God got in the picture. God swooped down and intervened. God showed up and everything changed. The light bulb went off. I could finally see, but when God who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. All right, so what we see here is that God had a secret plan, and that was that Paul would be an apostle. And God had this part rigged, and He chose... I mean, get get this. He purposely chose a person who was murdering the church. He purposely chose a person that was the church's worst enemy. Now just think about that for a minute. What kind of God would do that? A God of ultimate forgiveness, a God of ultimate mercy, a God who is not trying to seek revenge, a God of forgiveness and mercy and grace, and a God who wants to tell you something. If God can take the church's worst enemy and turn him into the apostle who wrote most of the New Testament letters, what does that say to you? How big are your sins? Have you been killing the church lately? Likely not. So this says something about how we need to see our sins as small and recognize our God as big and realize that He has qualified us just as He qualified that murderer, Saul of Tarsus. And that's exactly what he was. He was a murderer of Christians. And so we see against the backdrop of Saul's murders against the backdrop of the persecution of the best people on earth, meaning God's own children indwelt by the Spirit of God, being massacred and murdered and persecuted by this man, against the backdrop of all of that ugliness, we see how big and how important God's grace is. We see the importance of grace. But when God had set me apart... He revealed His Son in me so that I might preach among the Gentiles, not the Jews. He took this man who was so proud of his Judaism and so proud of his law-keeping. And when Paul got saved, you know how cool it would have been. I mean, just think about this if you're Paul. How cool it would have been. What an honor and what an in-your-face opportunity it would have been for Paul's ego to go back 
and be able to preach to his own countrymen and say, I've got the truth. I thought I had the truth before and I was the best Pharisee. But now, dudes, I'm the best Christian and I'm going to come to you and I'm going to fix you and fix your belief system and I'm one of you, but I'm better now because I've seen the light and let me show you the light, Jews. And imagine as the light bulbs would go off for his fellow countrymen how that might just stroke the ego of Paul, the Pharisee, the former Pharisee, now turned Christian and now an apostle. But God wouldn't have it. God, in his divine sense of humor, he says, Paul, yeah, it's great that you're saved. Now go out and talk to those guys. And he says, says, who, 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 Lord, who? Yeah, yeah, those dirty Gentiles, go talk to them. You know, the ones that you'd never sit with, that you'd never eat with, that you look down on your whole life. Yeah, 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 go to them, go to them. And he's all, what, 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 what do you mean, Lord? What do you mean? And the scriptures begin to unfold. I will call those people who were not my people, my people. Abraham will be the father of many nations by faith, not just Israel. And the whole thing, the scales fall off his eyes. And he begins to see how incredibly large, how great, how amazing, how important this gospel is. That it's not just for the geographical border of Israel. It is for anyone and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. And so Paul did not consult with flesh and blood, nor did he go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before him. In other words, it wasn't peer pressure. He says, I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I did go up to Jerusalem, but three years later, okay, to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now, in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying, right? Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. So what's the point of this geography lesson? What's the point of bringing up all these names? His point is, uh, this wasn't something we got together and worked on. This wasn't something that we agreed on and concocted or invented as a team. He's saying, I went off for three years by myself, just me and the Lord, and I showed up three years later with the same gospel that these guys got And we were in agreement when it all turned out, when it all became obvious that Christ was working in them and Christ was working in me as well, just the same. I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing, they kept hearing this, he who once persecuted us Jews is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy A total 180, the worst, a murderer, a persecutor, a mass murderer of Christians turned into a child of God, an apostle, an author of the New Testament. And they were glorifying God because of me. You see how important this is. Have you wrapped your mind around the importance of God's grace? God's grace is not a, a, just a theological point. It's not a trendy movement. It's not a special focus. God's grace is the gospel. The gospel of grace. Grace to you. Grace in you. Grace through you. Grace for salvation. Grace for daily living. Living under grace. Living by grace. Having God's grace teach us to say no to sin and live an upright life. Paul, the great defender of God's grace, was so amazed that they were deserting a simple message of all about God's grace, Jesus plus nothing. And they were adding to it and substituting it for something else. Will you stand? Will you stand firm in God's grace and not be moved? Will you recognize that God's grace is everything? You are saved, you are forgiven, you are righteous, you are holy, you are blameless, and you are equipped for daily living by God's grace. Let's thank Him 
Let's thank our Father. Father, we thank you for for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for your grace that you have lavished upon us. You have showered your goodness on us. You have equipped us. You have made us right. You have made us new. You have made us like Jesus at the core. And Father, all we can do is just thank you. And that's what we do today. We refuse to add to the message. We refuse to take away from it. We refuse to be distracted. We refuse for the the message to be perverted. We will not be moved. We stand in your grace and we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.